name is Alan Hart. I'm a graduate of Amherst College from the class of 1982, a professor in the psychology department, and the dean of students. I'm sorry that we didn't get a chance to meet during new student orientation, the weather that week had other plans for us as well as this past week. Um, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to address you briefly this morning and then to introduce uh, the president of Amherst College as well. Let me just say a little bit about the Dean of Students Office, the work uh, that, that my colleagues and I do. The Dean of Students Office is concerned with the personal, ethical, and intellectual growth of students and with their general welfare. Our department, in collaboration with close colleagues from around the campus, strives to do four different things, really, that I'll read here. One is to support students' learning, personal growth, and development of problem-solving skills, both inside and outside of the classroom. Number two is to help students balance the academic and non-academic parts of their lives. Number three, to help students manage the challenges and take advantage of the opportunities that they will face. And four, to foster and sustain a civil and collegial community that encourages meaningful contributions from all of its constituencies. I also want to add that you put a great deal of faith and trust in Amherst College by entrusting us with your sons and daughters. We understand this to be an awesome responsibility and not one that we take lightly. So we, on behalf of the community, I thank you for that. Hurricane Irene, a few months ago, prevented the start of orientation as scheduled, but does provide a window into the nature of the Amherst family to which many of you now are joining for the first time. And if you allow me to tell just a really brief story, and I'll, I won't use any names, but to, a, a story that sort of highlights the nature of the community and the family and, and the reach of Amherst College. Uh, uh, new student orientation started at the end of uh, August. And there was a student from, traveling from the West Coast to Amherst for the first time. The student had never been to New England before. Um, her family, her mother, put her on a bus in California, and she was taking a bus across the country to arrive in Amherst, hopefully on the, I think it was August 29th, the Sunday when orientation was scheduled to begin. The student, who you know, had not yet arrived at Amherst, got as far as Kansas City, Missouri. And at that point, the bus system stopped running and she wasn't going to be able to move any closer to Amherst for several days. So she called into the office, she called the Dean of Students office just to let us know that her arrival was going to be delayed. And as the call came in, there was a, another worker in the office who overheard the conversation and stepped in and said, you know, my mother just moved to Kansas City, Missouri. Um, and so we were able to contact the staff member's mother, give her the contact information for the student who was planning on spending at least three days in a bus station in Kansas City until the, until the buses started running again. And we were able to connect those two. And so the student, even before arriving in Amherst, had a place to go to, a, a friendly face, and a warm, you know, three warm meals a day. Um, and so that's sort of, there's stories like that all over the place. And I, we have stories from this past week that I think are of a similar nature that's kind of highlight the, the extent to which members of a community look out for each other. Um, and um, Hurricane Irene provides one example, but there are, there are countless others um, from this past week as well. It is my great pleasure to introduce the newest member of the Amherst family. The 19th president comes to us from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her academic, scholarly, leadership, and administrative credentials are impeccable, impressive, and well-documented elsewhere. So I won't say more about that. But I would like to add on a more personal note that she has already shown herself to be extremely smart, genuine, open, a strong communicator with a great sense of humor, a good listener, and a straight shooter. I find her, what I'll call her signature laugh, to be, uh, I think, uh, one of her most endearing characteristics. And so I hope that if you ask the right kind of questions, maybe you'll get a chance to hear it. Uh, <laughs> within the next hour or so. Um, as a member of the senior staff, I feel honored to not only be able to introduce her today, but to, but to be able to work with her and to call her one of my colleagues. Uh, so please join me in welcoming the 19th president of Amherst College, Biddy Martin.
Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good? It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful day. I'm so happy for all of you that it's such a great weekend. I will join Alan uh, and begin by thanking you for entrusting these extraordinary young people to us. I've never had a better time in my life than I've had with your children over the past two months. I know that the correct way to refer to your children is your students, but they're not your students. <laughs> they're our students, and I think they're your children for <laughs> as long as they live. Um, so forgive me if you're one of those people who thinks we shouldn't refer to them as your children. They are not children, but they are your children. And they are extraordinarily talented, unbelievably friendly and kind, in my experience, over the past two months. Whether I've seen them in the classroom, or at the symphony concert, or at uh, an inauguration flash mob event they organized for me, uh, whether dancing with them in the Keefe Center, eating lunch with them in Val, or just interacting with them on the pathways of this gorgeous campus, I could not have enjoyed them more. And I thank you for them. I think you must be extraordinarily proud of them. I certainly would be were they my children. This is uh, a gem of a college. And having spent most of my career at Cornell University and then at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, but having gotten my own BA at a liberal arts college in Virginia, William and Mary, I can say only that I'm delighted to be back uh, at a college that cares about the art of teaching, that cares about undergraduates, that puts as much intellectual capital into questions about how to teach young people how to ask their own questions as it puts into research and other domains. But I'm also pleased that your students, <laughs> there I will, I fell into the correct trap. I'm pleased that your children and our students um, are being taught by faculty who are also known in their fields beyond Amherst, beyond even the borders of the United States, as prominent scholars and scientists. Uh, I'm proud that our faculty are able to combine research, but prouder still that they're able to integrate undergraduate students into that research and give them an experience that is genuinely possible at a research college, but not always possible at a research university. It's a great faculty. The students are extraordinary. The staff could not be more devoted. I think all of us feel badly that at least some of your children will have gone almost a week without power in their dorms uh, and in other parts of the campus. Um, it's been a terrible inconvenience for some of them, some more than others, obviously. And uh, I couldn't be sorrier for that. We have faculty and staff who still don't have power. We do have power back in all of our campus buildings. Um, the staff at Amherst College could not have worked harder to ensure that people, all people on the campus, students, staff, and faculty, were cared for. And while absolutely happy to listen to any concerns you might want to express about the past week or anything else, I do want to take the opportunity to thank the administrators who've been working literally 24 hours a day to ensure that the campus is safe and that people had warm, uh, safe places to sleep. So I thank the senior staff and the managers who are sitting here. So Amherst College is faced with um, the task, I would say, of preserving what is unique and precious about Amherst. And I think it is unique in a whole range of ways that we don't need to discuss this morning because the purpose of this event is to allow you to speak and ask questions. How to preserve what's precious about Amherst, which to some degree is its contemplative landscape and sensibility, while also modernizing in ways that keep pace with opportunities for better teaching, better learning, and more cutting edge research. 
And that is the task uh, in which we will be engaged over the next five to 10 years. One first step on that journey is the new Science Center that our trustees approved just last month. The new Science Center will ensure that Amherst continues to be a leader, not only in research uh, at a college, but also a leader in the teaching of science. And that's absolutely critical for the future of Amherst College and for other liberal arts colleges. The building will be extraordinary. I don't know if you've seen any design plans. Maybe you've looked on the web page uh, and seen a few drawings, a few renderings. Uh, it will be the first building of its type on the Amherst College campus. It will be by far the largest, and it wouldn't take much, but it will be the most modern. <laughs> okay, I like the lack of modernity on the Amherst campus, and I'm pleased that this building, though modern, is being designed in a way as to complement the elegant simplicity of the other buildings and the landscape rather than to dominate them and start a trend toward a different kind of campus. I don't think it will do that, but I do think it will become a hub for everyone on the campus, and I hope in particular for students, whether they're interested in the sciences or not, it will be a space from within which they can enjoy this gorgeous, gorgeous landscape and enjoy one another because of the serendipitous meetings that are bound to occur there on that site. Uh, that's really a set of highlights and observations that I offer you, but as I said, the purpose of the hour is to have you ask me and other members of the administration any, anything you'd like to ask or any observations you'd like to offer up that are not questions. And we have, I guess we don't have microphones for you. I, I guess we don't need them in Johnson Chapel. Uh, so please um, feel free to begin the conversation. I guess I've begun the conversation, but please feel free to enter into it right now. Yes. Yes, I would be happy too. I, I really did not want to cancel trick-or-treating. Did you hear the question? Oh, let me repeat it. Um, I was forced to cancel the invitation I had issued to the campus to come trick-or-treating at my house. And this gentleman's daughter and her friends would be pleased if I rescheduled it. I, and this young man in the front row would be pleased too. I was really disappointed, and I know that the students went and put together costumes of various kinds because they told me. Of course, I had told them no costume, no treat. So <laughs> I think a costume party at which we give away treats would be in order, and we'll try to make that up. Any other requests? <laughs> yes. Question. Okay. Uh, first of all, a comment. When I arrived last night, I didn't recognize my son. Um, it's only been two months. <laughs> But I left a 17-year-old boy, and I, I mean, I, I was, I, it was breathtaking. He had grown, and he was a young man, and so happy. Um, I could just tell he was so happy. Um, but my question is, some of the other his friends that I met come from all over the world, and of course all over the country. And I was just wondering, when you send your recruiters out or your scouts um, to visit places like Zimbabwe, um, and really far away, is there criteria that they follow to find the perfect fit for this, this mm. college? It's a great question. So I'll make an observation, and then I want to um, ask Tom Parker, who, is, who leads the charge and has for some time uh, on admissions, recruitment, admissions, financial aid, and who is a genius. Um, I'm going to ask him to say something to you about it. What I will say is that I have not been on a college campus in my lifetime that has the diversity in its student body that Amherst has. And it is a gift to the college and to every single student who studies here that they get to live and study and build networks with people from all over the world, from every racial and ethnic background. That has been the source of the greatest joy for me. 
And to people who say, well, we have changed demographically, but the students don't interact across these boundaries, I will tell you it is not true. I go to Val specifically in order to sit and eat with groups of students, and um, I walk around the campus, and whenever I walk around the campus, it doesn't matter what time of night or day, I always encounter clusters of young people uh, in, in which at least two to three different racial or ethnic groups are represented. It's a beautiful, beautiful achievement. And I feel incredibly fortunate to have inherited it. And a big part of that achievement, and the person who can answer your question about how they go about recruiting this incredible student body, is Tom Parker. Tom, come up here and be recognized for the job that you do. And <laughs> Tom, do you want to come up here so they can see you better? Let me say that initially that there are countless and imaginative ways that you can express your gratitude. Um, <laughs> and it, it really is good to see you when, uh, when you're in the business of turning down 6,500 students a year, which is part of what I do, you can assume that there's many people who don't want to express their gratitude <laughs> to me. So these are happy occasions. And I'll, I'll, I'll just very, very quickly say, um, in answer specifically to the question, that we actively recruit all over the world. Uh, we recruit actively and in person and virtually uh, in, in the Palestinian, Palestinian territories, in Africa. In, uh, I, I'm just back from a trip where I was in Oslo, Norway, Bergen, Norway, Flecka, Norway, uh, Maastricht in the Netherlands, um, Wales, et cetera, et cetera. And during the fall, um, you just see us coming and going, not only throughout the world, um, but throughout the United States. Um, and having said that, it, it, this is not a, a one office show. This, this college supports admission and financial aid in absolutely extraordinary ways. One of the things that I've always said is that every administration or administrator that I've worked for here has put their money both literally and figuratively where their mouths are. So again, we, we actively, we have a, a tremendous luxury. To be as selective as we are allows us to assemble a class intentionally, deliberately, thoughtfully with the idea that, that, that your children get the best possible education, not only from our wonderful faculty, but from their peers. So, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to tell you that we just sort of throw caution to the wind and a, and, and a terrific class arrives, but there's a lot of work involved in it and it's very, very intentional work. So thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> I have a question about uh, alcohol and substance abuse. I wanted to ask what the college is doing to establish a context, a social context that prevents or reduces the opportunity for alcohol and substance abuse, and what role would you like parents to take in supporting that social context? <coughs> well, that's a great question, which I think the dean of students would like to answer since he's working on it actively at the moment. It's not that I don't want to. <laughs> It's such an easy question, given what goes on at college and university campuses. Uh, all I can say from my experience at a number of them is no one has a magic bullet. And the fact that you asked what parents can do is a great, great contribution. Uh, I think, Alan, do you want to answer? Yeah. First, I want to ask, where are the questions about parties at my house? It seems like that's a much easier question to have to deal with. Um, <laughs> But no, the alcohol and other drugs uh, is a concern at all college campuses. I would say at Amherst, um, you know, these sort of comparative statements are hard to make and hard to, hard to validate. But I think I would, I, I would say for the most part, I think our problems here are less, less severe than at other places. 
Um, but that's not to mean that we don't do a lot of programming um, and uh, both active and passive programming in residence halls, through the Dean of Students Office, uh, the number of offices on campus, through health education, the health center, counseling center, uh, varieties of different programming. But I do think it is one of those things that so many of these things are that it really requires, you know, it sort of takes the village. And so to have parents on board is a wonderful thing. And one of the things I would say for parents, and, I'll, I'll, uh, um, and maybe the, that culture has shifted a little bit too, but... I've been in the Dean of Students office for 10 years, and about eight years ago, I was walking across the quad on a weekend like this, and I literally passed a car that I saw that had a lot of alcohol in the back seat, and I sort of watched it circle around the campus and pull up in front of Charles Pratt dorm. And out of the car came two parents who were bringing alcohol into the building to leave with their children so that knowing that their child's a first-year student and not 21, they would not be able to legally purchase alcohol. The parents were doing it for them. So actually, I called the campus police on them. Um, it sent him over to the dorm and said, I believe there's some alcohol in a first year dorm that shouldn't be there. And the police went over and confiscated it. So I think part of the answer is that we need to do this together, right? It's not just an Amherst problem. It's a, it's a, it's a cultural, it's a societal problem. Um, so we are all part of the same team. So to enlist the help and support of parents is wonderful. Um, but we do also have a lot of active programming on campus. The number of events, you know, we sort of get involved with student social life. We give them a lot of latitude in selecting the kinds of things they want to do, but we also do some programming that we support and sponsor. So there have been some, if you look on the college website, there are a couple of, there's one up there right now that's been documented about a program that we started this semester called Amherst After Dark, where these are non-alcohol related events. Um, we had a, we've had three or four very successful ones this semester already. One on a Friday night, I think in early October, um, was a letter writing campaign where we had more than 300 students who came to the campus center and were given pads of paper and pencils, typewriters, quill pens, um, and were doing handwritten letters to friends and family. And we had more than 300 students do that on a Friday night. Um, so, so that's an example of the kind of programming that uh, you know, I think is starting to take root here that also helps us to shape and reshape what the social life is like. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone here from Wisconsin? Now there we have a real problem. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Wisconsin takes a different approach to it, and, and there's a lot of debate about it. That is, Wisconsin has in its student union it, uh, a pub that serves beer. Uh, and in a second student union that was just built, it has not only uh, beer service, but wine. And some people think that's uh, a legitimate approach. That is, that students need to, students who are of age, need to learn how to drink responsibly with adults who also spend a lot of time in these unions. I'll be honest with you and tell you that it sounds good. That is, that something other than absolute prohibition might... Um, help students learn to drink more responsibly, it, it, it doesn't work as well as it sounds like it might. So that's why I say I don't think any college or university has found the answer, but I think alcohol-free programming and establishing a context in which students understand what's expected of them um, helps. I also think student-initiated alcohol-free events seem on some campuses to work even better than administration conceived, well, as most things do. <laughs> Other, yes. I uh, see pictures and drawings of the new science center in degree is quite an impressive undertaking. Yeah. And I am sure that you have a long range building plan for the, the campus. And I wondered where the priorities were for bulldozing the social dorms. <laughs> <laughs> well, having toured the social dorms with our head of facilities, Jim Brasser, who was kind enough to take me there. <laughs> I'd say that it's, uh, it has to be very high on the priority list. Uh, I, I know the students like the social dorms. They keep telling me they do, but really they smell bad and they're terrible and they're failing and they need to go. So I guess I am a little bit too candid. Huh? They, but they do need to go. And I think at the moment, though we're, we're currently undertaking a long-range planning process, um, but we already know that the social dorms need to be part of our within the next five year uh, priority, along with the Science Center. Yeah, yeah. 
And hopefully we can do something really exciting there too, um, something that will give students the kinds of spaces that they describe to us as uh, an important part of their out-of-classroom experience. Yes? Uh, no, there are plans to put sprinklers in the social dorms, but it doesn't work in those basements. Is that what you mean by common rooms? <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, it's hard to think of them as common rooms once you've seen one. But um, <laughs> I know the students like them. But the students did ask me recently in an interview whether I thought that, the, that those spaces should be um, outfitted in a way that would allow them to use them. We can't do that, and I'll get Jim Brasso to explain why. But I said to the students, you actually need better spaces than that for the kind of socializing you want to do. Jim, can you explain why the basements of the social dorms can't be <laughs> sprinklered? This is Jim Brassard. I, I know many of you probably know him. Another extraordinary a member of the administration at Amherst College. Thank you for the, the question about the social dorms. Indeed, uh, we have plans to install sprinklers in those buildings this summer, which will uh, in, indeed indicate that fully 100% of our dorms are sprinklered. Um, our intention is really to put sprinklers throughout the social dorms uh, and we will attempt to put it into the social spaces as well of the basements. Um, the question really then becomes is the appropriateness of those spaces for large gatherings and parties. And that's something that we will continue to evaluate uh, with the dean's office and make a determination uh, as to whether those spaces are suitable for large uh, social gatherings. So. So I was wrong. I'm glad I asked Jim. <laughs> Thanks for the question. So I, I think that, is that clear enough? They'll be reevaluated after the sprinklers are put in. Sorry. Yeah, next year. Yeah. In the meantime, they can come to, I don't know, costume parties and things. <laughs> yes. Yes. The modular dorms. <laughs> right, but I think the question is what's going to be done. With so, Plaza and Waldorf, um, are, as they've been known for their existence, um, were, um, were constructed, uh, I don't know, about five or six years ago, maybe a little bit longer now, uh, and originally as one room doubles. They've been in use as singles, as relatively large singles for the last several years. And originally they were also first year student housing and they, the first year students have not lived in those for the last three years or so. Um, as we go through the transition of renovating buildings as we return to the residential master plan and continue to renovate the existing buildings, the, uh, the, we'll still maintain the use of the plaza and Waldorf as, uh, as upper class student housing um, through the renovation, probably through the renovation of the social dorms and then kind of re continue to reevaluate at that point. But it's part of a larger residential master plan that we are, we are reevaluating both with the change in the administration, but also as the economic downturn hit a few years ago, we were sort of in midstream of that master plan. Uh, and so that was put on hold uh, and we'll take that back up um, you know, this year. I like the idea of getting rid of them myself. <laughs> because when you look at the gorgeous view and see the Waldorf and the plaza, it's not like being in New York. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes, in the back. I'm sorry. You said about the pool hour. I was told that the uh, schedule of the current pool hour is more uh, catered to the swim team and regular students who just want to use that as a hobby. They don't really have the access in, uh, in off hour, like especially weekend. So I just want to see if it's possible to improve that. No, I haven't encountered the same problem. And uh, I was told that when the swim team season changes, the hours will open up. Is that correct? So when will that be? Just for those of us who... I'm sorry? We don't know? <laughs> the season ends at sort of mid-March, depending on how Ooh. many of them go on to the national. It's a long time. I, I don't know how to uh, improve that situation then because March is a long time away. 
Um, I agree that that's a problem, and it's part of what we need to think about going forward when we're thinking about facilities. I, I would agree with that. I think a nice lap pool is an essential thing for health and well-being. But one that actually allows you to swim in it. But, yeah. Yeah. Yes. The idea of uh, providing opportunities for undergraduate research really appeals to me, and I was curious whether that uh, that is somehow incorporated into faculty expectations, or is it a formalized policy at the college to try and you know, encourage faculty to provide those opportunities? Well, first of all, I haven't visited, what, part of what I've been doing since I've been here is visiting departments, uh, meeting with faculty, uh, visiting classes when I can, and I have not been to a single department where the integration of undergraduates in research isn't, um, not just an expectation, but uh, a, a, something that's enthusiastically embraced by the faculty and pursued. The Dean of Faculty's office, and I'll let Greg speak, um, another really marvelous, uh, absolutely marvelously talented and thoughtful uh, member of the administration and sort of the right-hand person to the president. Um, I don't know if Greg would say it's formalized, but he consistently provides funding and incentives to faculty and departments for the integration of students in research. Greg, do you want to talk a little bit about what you're doing? Greg Call. Uh, I have the great privilege of interviewing all of the candidates for faculty positions at the college. And right from that initial conversation, we talk about what aspects of their research they can share with their students. And that depends uh, greatly on the field. But uh, what I can report to you is that in my nine years as dean, uh, I've seen tremendous growth and interest, not only from our students, but from our faculty. Uh, we have a great tradition of students working in the sciences, in laboratories, with faculty mentors. But what we've seen in the last decade is that colleagues in the humanities and the social sciences are finding truly innovative ways to work with their students. One of our most exciting projects, and I see Professor Serrett has just uh, walked into the door here, and he is the, the leader of this project, are Mellon Research Tutorials, which I commend to all of your students. These are courses in the uh, humanities and social sciences whereby faculty work with small groups of students and introduce them uh, to research methods in their fields so that they learn how to do research uh, in political science, in, uh, in history, in, in whatever the professor's discipline is. And this, I think, provides them with a skill that they can take with them uh, beyond analyst, learning how to ask good questions, to analyze a problem, to figure out what you can study and how to do it. Uh, these combined with writing and quantitative skills are essential for students as they go on to careers that will evolve over the course of their lifetime. One of the things I, I love about Amherst is its focus on the fundamentals. Uh, but it's also true that it has introduced some of the more innovative ways to help students learn to think in a way, in an integrated way. And we have a center for community engagement that offers faculty support and students the opportunity to combine in-class learning with more practical, hands-on involvement in uh, communities. Uh, but there are also other opportunities. The students are increasingly interested here in entrepreneurship uh, and are seeking to find ways to make a liberal arts education and the fundamentals consistent with the kind of creative creativity and inventiveness uh, involved in being a little more entrepreneurial about what they can do. What I say to them is, you need not simply to think about finding jobs, you need to be the people who will create new ones, entirely new sectors, and they will be. They will be those people, and we want to support that kind of thinking. I think Professor Sarah is also the professor who doesn't allow slouching or yawning. <laughs> I think some of you attended his course this morning, and you will have gotten that joke, but the rest of you, I'm sorry, will not have. <laughs> Professor Sarah is one of the great faculty members at Amherst College. Yes. Good morning. I'm Dawson Collins, class of 85. I have two students here. I'm going to say that 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 I'm going to faculty members, mm -hmm. and um, I met Tom Barber on what he and his staff have done in terms 
terms of uh, diversity on our student body. And I'm concerned or at least curious um, what, what we're doing in terms of diversity on our faculty. The dean of the faculty will come back up. He and I have made this uh, one of our top priorities for the next five to ten years because, as you probably know, we have a spate of retirements, as all colleges and universities do, as the hiring bulge of the 60s becomes the retirement bulge of today. And so uh, this is an opportunity to diversify our faculties. Uh, and if we don't do it now, it will be another several decades before it occurs. Greg, you want to talk about some of what you're doing? Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. The, um, I, I was just asked by a colleague, did, uh, did I plant you, actually, to ask that question. <laughs> um, as, as many of you know, we are very privileged at Amherst to have a wonderfully long-serving faculty. And part of that uh, implies that we have not done a great deal of hiring in more recent years. But as uh, Biddy has just pointed out, uh, we're now at a point where um, we're seeing more and more colleagues taking phased retirements, and, and uh, as there has been some recovery in stock markets and other investments contemplating full retirement. And that provides us with uh, an important challenge to replace uh, a couple of generations, really, of outstanding faculty members, but really a tremendous opportunity to uh, think about what uh, we need on the faculty uh, going forward. And that, I think, uh, allows us to work very hard to expand our pools uh, of faculty candidates, to think about retention. You attract outstanding faculty to Amherst, uh, other colleges and universities who are also in a position of looking for new faculty over the next uh, decade or so will be uh, out there recruiting and uh, perhaps trying to steal faculty colleagues. So uh, creating the environment here that uh, makes teaching at Amherst and working with your students, uh, sorry, there I go, uh, our students, your, your children, uh, most attractive is, is absolutely crucial. Among the things that we're doing specifically with regard to diversity, are we're reaching out to the graduate programs which are uh, working in interdisciplinary fields in particular, but are producing uh, the outstanding uh, PhDs with uh, more diverse backgrounds. We're building relationships directly with some of those institutions. We're working to uh, think about more postdoctoral positions. These are early career opportunities for faculty uh, to get, <coughs> excuse me, to get the experience of working at a liberal arts college. Um, as though, uh, from Amherst perspectives, we recognize what a wonderful sector of higher education liberal arts colleges are. But really, the vast majority of students going through uh, college and graduate school are not exposed to liberal arts colleges. So we need to reach out and take the message to those prospective faculty members about how wonderful it is to be at a place like Amherst, just as we have done with our student body. And that is, I, I think, absolutely a principal focus of our work over the next decade or so. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Uh, first, an anecdote to the question about the research. So I'm a medical researcher. And I've had two, several consecutive Amherst students come to my lab. And because of their training, I specifically search them out because they do a thesis. And the thesis really prepares them, and they're as good as my postdocs. Mm -hmm. But my, my quest saw this high level of quality here, pre screening. For me, it's really kind of a nice link, and it's really been very powerful and helpful. And I think because they're so responsible and eager and bright. Um, but my question uh, comes to another question, is related to the fact that I have uh, N of two students going through here, um, is the question about career counseling. So if you talk to the students, if you're going to graduate school, if you're going to do science for two years, if you're going to Wall Street, um, there's no problem in what you're going to do. But for the people who are interested in a number of other diverse areas, whether it be working for an NGO or not sure, I, I think there's some concern on their part of how to do that. Even though there's a career counseling office, mm -hmm. you know, that always doesn't work, you know. And so one thing I was thinking is that, you know, if you go to Alumni Day at Amherst College, it's actually a career counseling day. Right. And if there's some way that we could integrate those days or somehow, or that general flavor, I think it would help a lot because we have NGOs, we have film, we have things that are not just a simple box that people see and how to have a way to communicate in a more casual way about how to enter that, you know, those different mm -hmm. realms. Mm -hmm. That's, a, I think, absolutely completely right. And can it be absolutely and completely? It's somewhat redundant, but it's, I agree with you totally. 
Um, <laughs> and I think getting alumni more involved, whether it's through a, a use of alumni days or uh, in other ways, is critical, and I think uh, a, a lot of my colleagues see that and are interested in doing something about it. Yesterday, the board of the uh, Center for Community Engagement met here, and two members of that board, who are alumni, came and talked to me uh, each separately, and each one of them also made the same point. They would, they would love to be more involved. Uh, they think that alumni can do more to help students think through career choices and be models uh, to them. I mean, I think it's just... You know, kid, kids, uh, excuse me, students, our children. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, it's one thing to go knock on the door of the career office, another to have an open, you know, sessions yes. where people will come and it's l much less pressure and a much less, and then they can actually see more. I think that would be, you know, I think that would be really a good thing. I agree. And I think more formal programs that allow alumni mentoring of students, even one-on-one, -on -one, to the degree that we, it can be arranged. It's labor-intensive to set it up, but I think it would be extremely helpful for the students. I just ran into a student uh, on a path to Converse the other day who had just come from the, the Career Center, and he said to me, I, I felt that he seemed sort of down, so I, I asked him, he said, I'm really depressed because all my friends knew what they wanted to be by the time they were 15 and they're getting ready to do it and I'm a senior and I don't know what I want to do. And so, but 10 minutes with him, I think, uh, assuring him that I didn't know what I wanted to do until relatively recently. <laughs> All right, that's an exaggeration, but I do think students need to hear from adults who didn't know what they wanted to do at the age of 15 and had no way of knowing because they came from backgrounds where what was modeled for them um, would not have stirred their imagination about the range of things they could do. More interactions of that sort would be extremely helpful. Yeah. And I don't have one last thought. I mean, something where you brought someone in for a session, kind of like a late afternoon seminar, and then there would be a dinner where people yes. would sit at the table and talk. About yeah. Something. Good. Thank you for the suggestion. I think that's completely right. Yes. Can you talk about the philosophy of fraternities, which you know don't exist here? <laughs> <laughs> I was so shocked a few weeks ago when I had dinner with a group of faculty after a symposium and they told me that there are a couple of fraternities that continue to exist underground. Not literally underground. <laughs> um, so which philosophy of fraternities would you like, mine or the, the colleges? Or uh, I think the college's uh, view is that there are no fraternities that are college sanctioned and that there shouldn't be. And I don't know the degree to which my colleagues are aware that there are a couple that exist in some form or other. I think it's a great thing that they don't exist. What I have said to students who ask me is, it's a great thing that there aren't fixed social groups that are the uh, permanent social circles for the entire four years that they're here. And there are other reasons not to like fraternities, too. But what the students say back that I take seriously is there may not be enough opportunities for uh, social interaction of the sort that they want. I'm, I'm, I'm giving credence only to those who want something other than the opportunity to drink. Um, so I don't know. I haven't been here long enough yet to be able to assess the picture other than to say I certainly wouldn't support bringing fraternities back. So that's our philosophy, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. First of all, I wanted to congratulate you as the first woman president in Hamlet. And uh, having said that, when your picture goes up on that wall, yeah. what do you want to be remembered as? For your what would your legacy be? And having been here two months, what do you see as the key challenges or things that you really want to accomplish in your presidency? Mm -hmm. Well, when my picture goes up, and she was pointing over here, so I think <laughs> I don't know where. Yeah, me either. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, good. Um, I said to her, when her picture goes up. What does she want to be remembered as her legacy? And secondly, she's been here for two months. 
And what does she see as the main challenges that she really wants to focus on in her presidency? Mm. So those are always great questions, and I might have a slightly unorthodox answer, sure. which is that after two months, uh, I'm not sure you want me to have an absolutely fixed plan for Amherst College. Um, what I've been trying to do and have enjoyed more than I could possibly tell you, actually, is try to live into the culture of Amherst College because when one comes here, I think, anyway, it's palpable that it has its own sensibility and its uniqueness and that one has to let oneself live into its culture uh, before deciding what one might have thought from the outside, for example, Amherst College needs to be or where it needs to go. I think what I said earlier is the way I would put it now, and that is that we need to find the way to modernize in certain specific ways while ensuring that Amherst does not lose what it has. Having been at other institutions of higher learning, I will tell you that uh, Amherst has things that are already lost to other universities and colleges. What are those things? Uh, I said a, a sensibility that is both intellectually intense but also contemplative, a kind of quiet in the midst of these enormous old trees and these simple New England buildings. Um, this face-to-face -face intimacy where teaching is conceived as an art, not as an obligation, not as a science, but as something to which each person can put his best intellectual work to work and does. Um, in larger institutions, I think the core of what Amherst is, which is teaching and learning and the integration of research with learning, um, have to some degree already gone missing. So my question for Amherst is how to do some of the things that it needs to do, for example, integrate technology more fully on the administrative side, but potentially also in its teaching. Um, how to extend its reach out into the world, how to become less insular and potentially uh, even more international, not simply by virtue of bringing students here from all over the world, but building partnerships uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, how to do that without simply following the trends that other universities and colleges have set, which are more focused on external values, I would say, now I'm overdrawing the contrast, but there is a contrast to be drawn. Whereas Amherst, perhaps because of its Calvinist tradition uh, and its location and its size, is focused inward in the best sense or on things that matter because they're interior to the community and interior to the spirit. Finding the right balance between that um, respect for and love of interiority and community and intimacy on the one hand and extending our reach and modernizing the ways in which we do our business on the other is what I consider to be the biggest challenge for Amherst College. The science building will be a great test. It's going to be as cutting edge as science facilities get how to make it cutting edge so that Amherst College leads in the teaching and conducting of scientific research without having Amherst simply become another one of those campuses where the sciences reign because they're the costliest and the flashiest and the arts and humanities diminish in visibility and importance. Because when the arts and humanities diminish in importance and visibility, something of the spirit of what a campus should be goes with it. So I'm not enumerating 10 things that I hope to be remembered for. I hope to be remembered for having helped Amherst be what Amherst is and having changed in ways that ensure that Amherst can continue to be what Amherst is rather than redefining Amherst. Amherst doesn't need to be redefined, but it needs 
to be able to preserve what it's going to be. It's, what Amherst is is going to be a more and more unusual niche in higher education. I know it's true because of where I've been. To lose that in the race to be like others, I'm telling you, would be a mistake. But that doesn't mean there aren't things we need to change in order to be who we are. That's how I feel about it. Challenge me on it. Next time. to say about that when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> you're disappointed how the Badgers are doing this? Oh, terribly. Yeah. Um, well, out in Chicago, we're kind of happy about it. But, oh, be quiet. <laughs> uh, but the, the serious question is, uh, for the whole question of alumni contribution towards the career development, in a time when, frankly, we see a lot of really talented students um, struggle in the job market and come home after a great education at a great school and uh, search, there is a program that Princeton uh, uh, has, uh, in terms of trying to steal faculty, the class of 55 uh, creates fellowships for uh, stu uh, students who go into community service. And I'm thinking it might be the class of 70 or 73. There's a lot of investment bankers uh, who went to this school who I think probably did quite well. And you have to meet alumni as you go along the road and raise for the many important right. things you do. But I'm wondering, given the great quality of the civic engagement here at the undergraduate level, mm -hmm. if there could be a task in identifying very successful classes or groups that would fund these fellowships. Because a gentleman I met mm -hmm. from Princeton came at two years of a modest stipend, and he's now a successful corporate lawyer, but he chairs the board of a uh, Crystal Ray uh, High School, a Jesuit high school. Mm -hmm. He gives back to Chicago through that. So I just point that out, that if there were a class of classes that as a part of their contribution to Amherst could see a service uh, uh, stipend right. for students who have that interest to carry it on, mm -hmm. I think those first two years out are often the path that lead to many different things, as you said, that, yeah. that children, our children can't imagine what that would be. Right. But the first two years seeds it, and they meet people, and things go from there. It's a great, it's a great um, idea, and Betsy Cannon-Smith, Megan Morey, who lead our alumni affairs and advancement operations, and Molly Mead, who is uh, head of the Center for Civic Engagement, I think will probably already have been thinking about these things, but maybe you all will put your heads together after today. Uh, these have been great ideas, I think. Can I, can I Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, because I want to talk about football. Okay. <laughs> 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 and I also want to point out that the director of our career center, Ursula Olander, oh, is up hi, here. Ursula. Um, and, and we also have a new position that's we also have a new position that started this year of a position in the career center that is devoted to alumni uh, mentoring and networking. And so these are actually there are initiatives in all of these fronts. And, that, and then the one thing to the question over here, I would also say that part of the challenge of the career center is that from a student's perspective, the, the corporate opportunities seem really visible and easily accessible. And we're aware of that, and that's been a concern about career center services for 40 years or longer. Um, and, and we have m many more initiatives uh, with NGOs and other types of opportunities that are just from the student's perspective are less visible or less accessible. And so, that's a, so part of it, I think, is a marketing, uh, informational sharing challenge as well. And so I think these are great ideas, but to also know that we have a lot of people on campus who are working very actively in each of these areas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. So I'll say just really briefly, I'm so glad that Amherst is undefeated. We're doing so well. And we should win today. We need, we need to, to be Trinity. We need to win the soccer matches. How are the women doing? Do we know? Oh, it's only it's starting at 11. Um, our, our, our athletics teams this fall have been spectacular. As for the Badgers, it's really sad. Since they're D1 and we're D3, I feel that I can still be a Badger fan, if that's okay, in my spare time. And uh, to lose, um, I mean, what are the odds of losing two straight games to a Hail Mary pass? I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And Russell Wilson, the great quarterback who used to be the babysitter of my nephew's uh, children in Richmond, Virginia, 
um, is a fabulous, fabulous young man. I mean, just the most decent, good-hearted young man you could imagine, and I feel badly for him. So that's all I have to say for now. <laughs> but if you'd like to know uh, my views on football, I'm happy to talk about them anytime. I grew up in a football-crazy rural southern family, and both my brothers were football coaches, one part-time because he was a fireman, and the other at the biggest high school in Virginia full-time. And so I feel as though I know something about football. <laughs> but I really don't know that much. Yeah. Yes? So there have been a number of questions and some dialogue along the idea of um, students looking t towards their future careers and uh, some academic programming along those lines. Um, when <clears throat> my son, who's a junior, when we were looking at the college, one of the attractions uh, in addition to the fabulous course offerings and faculty here, one of the attractions was the fact that it's part of the five college system and there were opportunities to take classes off campus. This year, my son um, identified a course at Mount Holyoke, an introduction to journalism course that was being offered by a fabulous um, columnist from the New York Times. And he was told that he could not take the class because it's pre-professional. And so I was wondering if you could speak to that policy, if you're aware of it, um, because to me it seems as though it's a bit counterintuitive when, on the other hand, he was doing all pre-med classes for a while, and there are the science students who are also taking science courses that are research and oriented towards entering the field. So just wondering if you have uh, any views on that matter. I'd certainly have views on it. Um, I didn't, I wouldn't have, think that, I wouldn't have thought and don't think, but somebody will probably correct me that that would be a college policy. Oh, I'm sorry, the question is, one of the reasons her son came to Amherst was not only because of the excellence of faculty uh, and the curriculum and other students, but because of the five college collaboration which enables them to take courses uh, at other institutions in, in the Valley. And he wanted to take, found a great pre-journalism course, or journalism course, introductory to jur uh, journalism at Mount Holyoke and was not allowed to take the course because it's defined as pre-professional. So we're, we're trying to figure this out right now for you. <laughs> I want to point out I was sent up here by my colleagues. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, don't, I don't know the particulars, um, but I can tell you that the process is really for that for college credit, uh, that decision is made by the registrar's office in consultation with faculty in the field. And uh, if this is a course for next semester and your son would like to uh, you know, resubmit the request, we'd be glad to, to look at it. Um, if it's a course that uh, your son would be asking for credit within a major, that decision would be made by the faculty in that department. Yeah, that it wouldn't count for a major would, would make sense to me just because often courses on any other campus might not. But why don't we talk? Yeah. yeah. try courses in different disciplines and he's not interested, you know, he's an econ environmental studies major. Right. This wasn't for satisfying classes in his major. It was just to try out a great course with a great professor at another campus. Well, let's make sure that he uh, brings this forward because it seems like an important case for us to examine for the good of everyone. Um, good, thank you. Yes. So the question is what data we have really about whether Amherst students do take advantage of the five colleges. Having just come from meetings of the presidents of the five colleges, I know that Amherst's um, rate, at least according to the head of the five college consortium, is, is up, but I don't know the, the numbers. I do know that Marion probably does. Yeah, Marion Matheson, who is 
head of institutional research and has numbers for everything. Um, <laughs> does a great job with a very small staff. Mary? Oh, good morning. Um, uh, students from Amherst average taking about one five college course over their four years here, um, some more, some less. Some majors and programs are designed to target the use of the five colleges more than others. And some departments work more cooperatively with their five college um, colleagues across the valley. So there is great variation, but it's up from about an average of about 1.2 to about 1.4 courses for each graduate of Amherst College. And when you ask whether the, the uh, relationships could be enhanced and will over time be enhanced, I think the answer is definitely yes. There's ongoing effort to make it easier for students to take courses elsewhere. I know one of students' complaints, for example, about going to Smith is that it takes so long that they have to devote a half day or more to the project of taking a course there. And there's some work on the part of the Five College Consortium to, to ease that burden. Uh, I think that the Five College um, Consortium is, is a very important one, too, and that you know, we'll continue to work with the others to see what more can be done. Um, yes, one more question, I'm told. experience that our son wanted to take a class at UMass and he was not could not could not take it to get credit. Um, and we felt it was sports management, which was something he was interested in going into. And we were told that the policy is if it's not liberal arts and the faculty makes that decision, then they cannot get credit. But I really think I'm glad to hear you say you're open to looking at it because one of the things the college advertises is this five college opportunity. And yet, when a student wants to take a class, they can't get credit for it, and it wasn't available here at Amherst. So he was not, he just never took that course, and it was most unfortunate. So I would encourage you to talk to the faculty and see if you can't be a little more um, open to some of those classes at the other schools. You can certainly ask the faculty to take it up. I tell you um, honestly that I'm thinking intro to journalism is probably a better bet than sports management just because sports management is more narrowly professional in its direction. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't or won't ask the faculty to look into it. Yeah. Thank you. Yo. Oh, that was UMass's problem. <laughs> yeah. Right. So what I think I can say is that it's, it's good to know that several of you are concerned uh, about the lack of ease with which students can move uh, freely back and forth. And what I want you to know is that not everything will work out because it is a faculty prerogative to think through which courses make sense. Um, I think, in general, uh, the complaints from students about not having courses count that they take elsewhere must be quite low. Marion, would that be the case? Yes. Yeah. But these specific examples of where it has been a problem are very important for us to, to it, at least to look at. And we will continue to work hard to, to make the five college connections work better. I'll tell you one thing, if I were a student at Amherst, Oh, no, I shouldn't say this. <laughs> no, it's just that there are so many great courses here. And when people at the other colleges complain to me that our students don't take enough courses elsewhere, I, I think, okay, we'll do the best we can to encourage them. But the teaching is so spectacular here. I have to say that I understand their propensity to stay home. I want them to... <laughs> I want them to go abroad. I want every single student at Amherst to have an international experience, even if it's only three weeks long. That's what I'm more concerned about. They need to get out in the world, and the valley is not big enough. Yes. Uh, our son has had several professors come over from UMass to teach a course yes. here, so I don't know how much of that, but which can be a good thing and a bad thing. This semester, it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. There are some joint appointments uh, of faculty at the various colleges, one or two, or sometimes three. 
Yeah, and they do go back and forth, and we're trying to do that in order to create, you know, in part, this is a way, and probably a wave of the future at higher ed, in higher ed, to create some efficiencies as opposed to having every college teach everything. But they need to be as good as our teachers when they come. Yeah, I agree. I think everybody needs to leave and go see women play soccer or do something else fun. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you.